Hello, everyone, and welcome to Million Dollar Gift. I'm James Milan. Today, I am talking to the executive director of Arlington Eats, Andy Doan. Andy, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Um, as you might know, uh, Million Dollar Gift focuses basically on the, you know, almost uncalculable benefit uh, that our community derives here in Arlington from volunteer energy of all sorts. And of course, your organization is an excellent example uh, of that. Um, just tell us a little bit, just to start out, tell us a little bit about, you know, the history and the operations of Arlington Eats. Yeah, so Arlington Eats has a very long history with the community. Uh, it actually originally started back in 1991 as the Arlington Food Pantry. So there was a group of churches and town leaders who got together realizing that there was hunger in the community that often was unnoticed. And so they said, you know what, let's do a food pantry and see what happens. And they were surprised at how many people showed up. So the food pantry uh, went forward and was uh, uh, in existence and at um, Church of Our Savior for, I wanna say 26 years. Uh, the math may be a little off there, but uh, a long time. They were operating a long time <laughs> at Church of Our Savior. Um, and at that time, the town was organizing and uh, overseeing the, the food pantry at the time and realized that this need in Arlington in terms of hunger was not going away and that it was just growing. And so they really felt like we need to have a more uh, robust response to it and uh, have a more organization behind it. So I was actually hired as the first executive director of the Arlington Food Pantry uh, five years ago. Uh, at the same time, back in 2014, um, there was a group of parents who were um, noticing that some of their um, some of their kids' friends were going without lunches in the summer. So we know that there are 650 kids on free and reduced price lunches in Arlington. Uh, and if summer school's not in session over the summer, they are missing out on that lunch and sometimes even breakfast. Uh, so this group of parents got together and uh, around a kitchen table and just started planning what they could do to uh, address this need. And so they started making sandwiches back in 2014 and started a summer lunch program, which expanded to a vacation lunch program and snack program and various things. And so that group was originally called Arlington Eats. Uh, and they, as the food pantry was starting to get off the ground and become actually its own nonprofit, Arlington Eats was going through the same thing. And so we had already been working together really well and we had similar missions. So we decided as uh, the food pantry in Arlington Eats that it would be best for the community if we joined forces and became one organization. Uh, so in 2017, the Arlington Food Pantry and the original Arlington Eats merged into one organization. Uh, and then we actually rebranded the name of the entire organization as Arlington Eats uh, in 2019. Uh, and our tagline really is about neighbors serving neighbors. So we see ourselves as an organization where the community are coming together, our neighbors are coming together and serving their neighbors. And that can mean a lot of things. It can mean serving in terms of food, or it can mean in serving in terms of developing community and relationships. And a lot of times you don't know which neighbor's which. Uh, and that's what we love about our organization. Yeah, and clearly the the very roots of the organization, as you've just described it, this 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 gathering of parents who noticed uh, an issue ne that needed to be addressed and then wanted to do something about it, it that goes right to the heart of what you're saying: neighbors helping neighbors. Um, I am struck, and I just wanted to make note of the fact that you mentioned that there are 650 uh, students in the Arlington schools who are a free and reduced lunch program. That is a significant portion of our student population. I'm not sure if most Arlington, most Arlingtonians realize just how high a proportion that is, is represented there. Yeah, it's really interesting that we have that many people, uh, that, uh, many kids that are on free reduced price lunches. And we actually know as the community as a whole has 3,500 food insecure individuals. Um, so I think a lot of times hunger is hidden in Arlington. You know, we see million dollar homes, we have great schools, people are flocking to live in Arlington, uh, but we have many of our neighbors that are struggling paycheck to paycheck and something like a medical uh, issue or a job loss uh, or a pandemic can put people in a situation where they're, now they're doing, having to decide, do I pay my rent, do I pay my mortgage, or do I get groceries this month? Um, so we're, we're seeing that more and more, of course, in the current situation. Yeah, and again, I, I think that this is eye-opening, most likely. Uh, I've been living here in Arlington for 25 years. I've been generally aware of this, of course. Um, and But I think it is an eye-opening fact uh, as we move forward. 
Um, so tell us what, you know, what it, I think people have an understanding or a general sense of what, how a food pantry operates. Mm -hmm. um, but let us know uh, a little bit more about just the operations day to day, again, under mostly normal circumstances um, that, that, uh, that Arlington Eats employs. Yeah, so we actually call our food pantry the market, the Arlington Eats Market, uh, as a way to kind of provide a dignified name. I mean, we all have connotations of what a food pantry looks like, and we want people to know that we're not your typical food pantry. So uh, when you come to us, and we're, the market's currently located at St. John's Church on Pleasant Street. So when you come to us, uh, under normal circumstances, uh, you will be astonished at the amount of food that you're given and the variety. So we are a 100% choice pantry, so uh, you're not given a bag of food in normal circumstances. Uh, you're able to pick exactly what you want. So we do have the typical shelf-stable foods of peanut butter, pasta, tuna, uh, canned fruit, canned vegetables, those kind of things. But we also pride ourselves on being able to offer so much more than that. So we do... Um, we have eggs typically every week. We have some kind of dairy products, whether it's cheese, yogurt, butter, those kind of things. Uh, we also have several meat selections. So we provide fish, um, beef, pork, chicken, different options for folks. And we have a widespread of fresh produce. Uh, so we, uh, it's funny how uh, every time we've kind of redone our program or, or thought through things, we said, okay, this is how much produce we want to give out. And we built furniture or we have enough tables for it. And then we just keep adding and adding and adding um, <laughs> because who doesn't want fresh produce? Uh, so that's kind of what someone would experience when they come through, that they would go through and they'd be able to ch uh, choose what they want. Uh, we do tailor a little bit towards family size. So, you know, a family of one to two is going to get a smaller amount than a family of four to six, of course. Yeah, you know, in a recent conversation we were having, um, kind of looking at the distinction between people availing themselves of uh, a food pantry or the market in this case um, versus saying enrolling in the SNAP program. Um, one of the virtues that was pointed out of the, by our interviewee about the SNAP program as far as a lot of people are concerned is just that it creates, it gives people the means to then have them make their own choices about what food they're going to get. But it sounds like you guys are doing you know, moving quite far in that direction yourselves in terms of, again, having, letting people choose from a, a good variety of foods, um, yeah. what it is that they will be taking away with them. Yeah. And we really encourage people also to sign up for SNAP as well. I mean, those SNAP dollars can go so much further for folks. And to be able to shop at your own local grocery store, I mean, there's just something great about that. So we want people to see us not as replacement, but rather a supplement. Uh, you know, when food pantries were first started, it was like, okay, this is emergency response. People are going to need us for a short period of time. That's not the case. Um, we have people that have been uh, coming to our market or food pantry for five, 10 years. Um, and we know that a lot of folks, um, you know, their, their economic situation may not change. If they're a senior on a fixed income, that's probably not going to change with any kind of job situation. So uh, we see ourselves as a mainstay for a lot of people, but uh, we certainly want people to get connected to other resources as well. And do you find that your, you know, the clientele, especially those who, as you say, you've seen coming in over a period of years, is that demographically kind of across the spectrum or is it, do you, do you have some, uh, you know, like cater to particular populations more as you've noticed? So um, about 30% of the folks we see are seniors. So uh, we see quite a few seniors, but we are seeing a lot of families as well that are coming through. Um, and it, again, it just depends on someone's uh, individual circumstance, whether how long, again, we have people that come to us once or twice because of a uh, economic bind, but then there's other folks that are, you know, use us frequently uh, for many years. Mm -hmm. um, and just to take a step back for a second um, and, and look at the organization on an organizational level, um, is it, it, it is, Arlington Eats is a nonprofit, I assume. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And is it run? What is the role of the town in terms of running Arlington Eats? Yeah, so the town used to kind of be, I would say, the fiscal sponsor for the Arlington Food Pantry. But in 2017, when we became a nonprofit, mm -hmm. uh, we were no longer the fiscal agent, or the town was no longer the fiscal agent for the food pantry, we became our own entity. Um, the town is, of course, very supportive, and especially in the COVID-19 um, days, we've been really working closely with the Board of Health and Council on Aging. Um, but 
uh, in terms of we don't get any regular funding from the town um, or anything like that. It's just mm -hmm. uh, support. Great. Um, and speaking of support and you know where things are coming from, and again, reminding our viewers that uh, you are watching Million Dollar Gift, what is the percentage, roughly speaking, of uh, employees versus volunteers who are making the work of Arlington Eats happen? We are definitely a volunteer organization. Um, so we have three staff members, um, and I can't remember how many FTEs. It's like 2.5 full-time equivalents. So we're, yep, yep, we're full staff, uh, and we have uh, well over 100 volunteers that come uh, and serve with us. Some volunteers are just doing it once or twice because of uh, you know their availability, but others we see them coming every single week and making sure they're helping to unload our truck or they're making sure they serve the lunches or they're helping people make their decisions and choices at the market. Uh, so we are uh, very much, the heart of who Arlington Eats is, is within our volunteer corps. And of course we are right now still talking about how things operate normally. I'm gonna be interested to find out what effect on you know, the number of volunteers you can count on coming, you know, coming in each day, you know, what the effect of that has been. But just a couple more questions about your normal operations before we go, or before we move on to the next uh, topic. Um, wondering, the, the folks who are coming in, is this uh, mainly or exclusively for Arlington residents? Um, do people, can people just drop in? Do you have to fill out some kind of application? How does that happen? Yeah, so we are restricted to Arlington residents. Uh, we're very much an Arlington organization, so we have that restriction in place. Um, but we don't require any income information. We don't verify income, anything like that. We figure if people need to come to us, they need to come to us. Um, on our website, arlingtoneats.org, we do have our uh, application on there. So it's a very simple application just so we can understand the family size, um, how many people uh, are in your household, and your uh, food allergies and preferences and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a pretty simple application that we have people fill out. And they can either do it ahead of time, again, going to our website, or they can do it the first time they show up. There's no, no, no pre-screening, anything like that happens. Mm -hmm. And are, are you able to accommodate either, you know, in that application process or with counselors or anything like that, uh, like non-native English speakers? Um, do you cover lang other languages as well? Uh, we do. So we have... Um, we have seen a growing Mandarin speaking population over the last several years. And, and so we actually do have volunteers. We have several volunteers who are on site um, to be able to translate for us and, and interpret for us. Um, the other languages that we see are Russian and Greek and Arab um, and French. We don't always have a translator right on site at that moment, um, but we do try to make sure all of our signs and everything like that are translated. And if we need someone, we can always, they're always a phone call away to be able to translate for us. That's great. Um, I'm wondering, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about what you do to get the food out to those in need. Um, where does the food come from? Um, and does that change at different times of the year? In the summer, do you work with farmer markets or anything like that? How, how does that part of the puzzle work? Yeah, so I would say 40% um, uh, of the food that we get comes from the Greater Boston Food Bank. Uh, so we became a member of them. Uh, back in 2014, uh, and it's really a great partnership. We can buy food through them for about 27 cents per pound. Uh, so you're not gonna be able to go to the an average grocery store to get that. So we get a lot of our staple items from them. A lot of our produce comes from them as well as meat and eggs and all those kind of things. Um, I would say another 30%, um, I'm gonna get stuck on my percents because I'm probably not adding them up, right? But um, yeah. another 30% yeah. actually comes- I left my calculator back in my backpack. It's good, we're okay, good. Good, <laughs> good. So I'd say another 30% actually comes from donations from the community. Uh, so again, Arlington Needs is such a strong community focused organization that we pride ourselves on getting a lot of our food donations from um, the community. And so, uh, which also allows itself to have more variety to folks. So there's only certain items we can get from the Greater Boston Food Bank, you know, in terms of cereal. There's only one brand of cereal we can get. But, you know, our volunteers and our community can, can bring in other uh, additional items so that we can have a variety. And um, we also rely on heavily on Foodlink. Uh, so they're another Arlington-based organization that does food rescue. So they rescue food from places like grocery stores and restaurants and then bring them to us to distribute to folks. 
Um, and then in the summertime, we have a great partnership with an organization called Boston Area Gleaners. Uh, so they're unique where they have volunteers go out to the field and uh, harvest food that's going to be left behind uh, and then bring it to us. And, you know, sometimes we even have dirt that's still on the potatoes and the carrots that come through. And it's just like the most fresh, gorgeous produce we get. So um, those are kind of the main ways we get our food. Yeah. So we are, you know, of course, here at Million Dollar Gift, as you might imagine, very familiar with Food Link and Bag as well and, and Boston Area Gleaners as well. And just wonderful to hear that that collaboration goes on all the time. We do know, and this is going to segue us into uh, talking about how you guys are operating and what the impact has been of the current situation on your operations. Um, but we do know that that one of the great bright spots, one of the silver linings in what is going on is that our organizations as well as individuals have tried to figure out how to leverage working together to be able to increase and expand um, the services and goods that they can offer to those in need. Um, how, ha how does that work with Food Link, local restaurants, Boston area gleaners, et cetera, who else have you added now as, as partners that you're working with under the current circumstances? How are, how are the, the existing collaborators, uh, you know, your existing collaborations doing? Just, just speak to that for, for a bit, please. Yeah, so when we first got wind that uh, COVID-19 would be a thing here in the Boston area or the United States, um, we reached out to Board of Health right away. And so because of our roots with the town, we already had a great relationship with them. And so it just started brainstorming with them what this could look like for our community. Uh, and things quickly escalated right away where we realized that we need to change our operations. Um, and so we have had a great collaboration. In fact, I was on a meeting this morning with uh, the Council on Aging and Food Link and uh, the public schools, the director of food services, so that we can work together to make sure that um, everybody has the food that they need in the midst of this crisis. Um, and I don't think a lot of communities have that. Um, I think Arlington's unique that we are in some ways still a small town and we can still work together and we have just great relationships and collaborations that we can really, um, that benefit us in the midst of this crisis. So yeah, we were able to start right away, start talking about what we were gonna do and how we were all gonna shift our operations. Um, and these are crucial relationships to have right now as we're, um, I don't think any one agency or organization could do all of this. We all have to work together in the midst of, of this to make sure that um, our entire community is cared for right now. And how, how have you shifted your operations? Yeah, so the, in March, we made um, we made some changes to so that people could still come to the market. I mean, again, we want people to have that choice. Uh, and so we put up right away, we put X's, we made six feet um, designations between people. We put up tables to have, um, you know, normal traffic flow so people can understand where they're going to go, um, that kind of stuff. But we did, um, the end of March, uh, we were notified by Board of Health that we could no longer have uh, the market open. Mm -hmm. um, again, Arlington is unique in where, because uh, you may have seen a lot of places are doing like drive by, like, Cars drive by, you put groceries in their trunk and they go on. Uh, we know that 60% of the folks that come to us either take public transportation or walk. So we can't walk, do right. kind of a drive-through um, delivery model. So we transitioned to a 100% home delivery model. Uh, and the way that we're making this work is again, partnerships. So um, Council on Aging has kind of become our, their phone number has become our food hotline. Um, so any individual, regardless of age, that lives in Arlington can call this hotline um, or they can go to the Arlington Eats website and fill out a form. Um, so we try to give people, again, a choice of what food they want, because if we're giving people food they don't want, then that's not helping the situation. Mm -hmm. um, so we do provide some um, limited choices for people so that they can um, decide, you know, what kind of rice or what kind of canned vegetables. And again, we're always bringing uh, fresh produce into the mix as well. Um, so the eats kind of takes care of the food part and the packing part and making sure that we get the right orders together. Uh, and then we are we're also working with Medical Reserve Corps. Um, so they're a group of uh, volunteers that, um, you know, are deployed in the midst of something like this, a pandemic, um, to really work and make sure that, um, you know, in this situation, they're getting the food directly to the people. So they're doing the del food deliveries for us. Uh, and of course, food link yeah, I have to say. oh, yay, great, there. thank you <laughs> for doing that. Um, and then, of course, we're working with the Greater Boston Food Bank and Food Link and restaurants then to be also supply uh, the food for us so that we can pack those bags. So, you know, a, a typical family 
we're, we're being able to almost maintain how much we typically give people uh, because of these partnerships, because we're able to kind of all have our own thing that we're focusing on to be able to make sure that the food is going out. Um, so, you know, for us, um, last week, uh, and probably this week as well, we served about 250 families. Um, and for compared to our market, our normal numbers, that's a 50% increase. Mm. Um, also looking at the folks that we're serving, um, it's a 30, 35% are new to us. So they've never been to the market. This is the first time they're accessing food uh, in this way. And so uh, we, of course, are hearing the unemployment numbers. Uh, in Massachusetts, uh, food insecurity is now at a 38% rate. Uh, which is about four times normal. So we know that, um, yeah, that the things are really hard for people right now and uh, we're, we're doing what we can to respond to that. And we plan on being here for the long haul to make sure that food continues to be available. Um, yeah, for Talk. as long as possible, we will do that. Right. right, and you know, one of the things, <laughs> here's a gap I see in the model and I'm sure you guys have recognized it. Um, there are a certain number of people, I assume, a certain percentage of folks who would uh, come to the market with some regularity, I imagine, um, who are homeless, who um, simply there is no fixed address to which you can uh, deliver any goods. Um, do you have a sense of how many, you know, what kind of percentage of, of folks who avail themselves of, of Arlington Eats is uh, homeless or at least without a place to deliver food to and and what if anything can you do about that yeah so there is already and this was a collaboration that got started before any of this happened um, a human service network here in arlington where agencies are coming together to talk about specific situations of individuals that are homeless um, in Arlington, we have a low number that are um, like living in tents or living in their cars. There are people that exist in Arlington that are, are doing that, but it's a slow percentage. Um, and they're on the radar. So um, Health and Human Services is working to make sure that those folks are being cared for. Um, we, what we see more of is people living on other people's couches. Um, mm -hmm. And that's still considered homeless. Um, mm -hmm. So thankfully, they have an address we can deliver to. And I've even gotten a few requests saying, hey, I need to put in an order for myself but my friend is living with me now too. Can they also put an order at the same address? And we're like, of course, you know, we'll deliver to both of you um, at that address. So yeah, we are again, relying on um, the, the health and human services and other social workers and social agencies in Arlington to really help address that as well. Yeah, and I know from a little bit of work with the MRC so far um, that there are lots and lots of safeguards in place um, for people delivering the food, you know, as is the model that you're following now. Uh, have, how have you found, what kind of impact has there been so far um, in this pandemic time um, on your volunteer corps um, and on the folks that you, you know, can count on to make these deliveries every day? Yeah, so that's been really hard. It was a tough decision for us, but we got recommendations from the Board of Health that we did need to put in some um, restrictions in terms of our volunteer groups. Um, so we did have to make the decision to um, individuals that are 60 and over um, could not volunteer at the time, as well as anybody high risk and any teens. So that actually took a big number of our volunteers, especially yeah, the regular that's... volunteers that we so depend on that are coming every single week, kind of know where everything's at. We can just say, hey, go do this, they do it. Um, so we are really saddened by that, that they aren't able to volunteer right now, but we know that for, um, you know, for us to get past this as a community, that these are the restrictions we have to put in place. Um, thankfully, there's a lot of people have come forward and said, hey, we're available now, we weren't before, can we come volunteer? So uh, since this pandemic has started, we have had about 130 new volunteers register with us. Uh, so we're definitely putting them in place and getting them to work. Our, our numbers are a lot lower. Again, we can only have, at a typical shift for our market, we'd have about 20 volunteers come. Right now, we're limiting to eight, nine people mm -hmm. to volunteer. So it's a lot limited right now. Um, and we know that once this is over with, that a lot of people are going to go back to work, which is great. And so, and we'll be able to have our regular volunteers come back. And I think we're going to have a big party <laughs> to welcome everybody <laughs> back, you know, once we get I all would back. think so, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so it sounds like, r roughly speak, well, it, it, uh, so again, Calculator having been left behind, but I'm struck by a couple of numbers. You were saying that um, yesterday or recently in terms of deliveries to how many families, that that was double what you would be seeing at the market under normal conditions. And what I just heard you saying is you're about at half of the number of people who are able to kind of volunteer and 
provide a lot of the of the of the grunt work labor to get the food to yeah. uh, to to your clients. Um, how's how's that work if you're delivering twice as much food, uh, but you have half as many people doing it? Is it just folks are doing longer shifts, or is is that how things are working out? Yeah, so it's actually a fifty percent increase. So not quite, not quite double. Oh, sorry, yet. sorry. Uh, fifty percent uh-huh. increase in how many, yeah deliveries. Yep, it, I'm sure you said that. Um, yeah, it's it looks a lot different. So yeah, we've had I would say at least fifty percent of our volunteers are not able to volunteer right now, um, but we've had about one hundred thirty people sign up. So we are getting a lot of new people right now. So that's helping. But again, our shifts are so fewer in terms of how many, how many people we could have on there. Um, in a lot of ways, you know, we do a lot of work at the market normally to make sure it's a 100% choice uh, model. So, you know, we're setting up shelves and we're setting up all this furniture and whatnot. Um, And right now the way we're doing it is we're packing bags. So each individual volunteer gets a packing list, they go through and fill the bags and so on and so forth. It's it's like an assembly line, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, So we are able- You've had to make the process just that much more efficient and sacrifice a little bit on the choice side to do so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that makes makes a lot of sense. I'm curious um, about what changes you, you know, to the way that you are doing things have come about because of this that you think might uh, continue uh, in force even after, assuming there is an after, um, uh, we, get, we get by this. Are, are there things that you guys have learned or, or things you've had to do uh, under the exigent circumstances and that you realize, oh, this is either a good idea or people are very happy about this or in some way you want to hold on to that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, right now we're just so in response mode that we aren't, you know, we're still working on how is this process working and how can we make it better? Um, And, but I think one of the things that because we're seeing a lot of new people, we have an opportunity now to ask people who've never been with us, what do they want? What's prevented them from coming in the past? Is it, purely economic, like I'm now unemployed, I have to, or is it, I don't want to go to the market or food pantry because I don't want to stand in line. So, you know, I'm hoping that when things settle down a little bit, we can maybe do some phone calls or some surveys where we can ask people, what are your preferences? What can you, how can we make it so that, um, you know, where are your barriers and how can we um, limit your barriers in terms of getting access to food? Um, So I think those are kind of some of the things that we're going to take away from this. Um, You know, we've always kind of done some home deliveries for folks that can't get out. um, And now we can do a little more, um, you know, a robust, again, um, choice model. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think before it's been kind of like, we'll we'll try to work with you, but we're limited. But now we can say, okay, we can actually do it. Uh, We have an opportunity of, uh, we have an online form or we can have someone fill it out for you um, so that you can have exactly what the food you want. You know, I wonder if there is, um, if there are people who, uh, clearly there's, there, there's been this enormous expansion, 50%, as you were saying, uh, in terms of families who are being served um, by the home delivery system. I'm wondering how many, if any of those, that increase um, might be due to the fact that people would feel stigmatized or a perception of, of stigmatization about coming in uh, to the market, um, and but are are willing to you know have a home delivery where they're not running the risk of I don't know so somebody that they know seeing them or whatever it is that that would concern them about coming to the market. Do you have any idea whether that might be happening in some cases? Sure, that's a speculation, um, but at this point we have no idea. We need okay. to do some surveying and understanding what people. Well, um, yeah, uh, you know. I was curious about that. That may not you know, have any benefit. Knowing, knowing that one way or the other may not have any benefit for your operation. So that's, that's fine. Yeah, I think it will. I mean, again, you know, earlier in the conversation, we said there's 3,500 food insecure individuals. Now I'm going to guess that that's going to go up um, because of our, our economic situation. But uh, we, we knew that we were serving about 15 to 1,800 individuals with all of our programs. So that's, you know, not half, but not even, you know, we're, we're still a long ways from serving everybody. And we don't plan on, on serving everybody. We know there's other programs like Meals on Meals. Um, of course, Food Lake has our drop off at various places around town. So we're all kind of working together. But I think at the end of the day, we just want to make sure that everybody, regardless of the pandemic, has access to the food they need, because really no one in our community should be going hungry. 
Well, I'm, I know that you guys are 100% com committed to that, to getting people the food that they need. How can people get you what you need? Um, and what is that? Is it money? Is it more volunteers, masks? You know, what is it that you could use? Yeah, so I mean, those are changing every single day. <laughs> we're right now we're like, how do we get bags? Um, you know, we haven't figured out a good system yet. So I think at this point, you know, the best way to support us is either through volunteering and uh, or financially donating. Um, we are last in March, we um, increased our food budget by 66% um, because we're having to buy so much more because we're not getting as many, we can't take community donations right now. We hope to somehow figure out a way to re-implement that eventually, um, but right now we're not quite sure. So yes, uh, and our website has all that information. Um, ArlingtonEats.org. So people can go there to donate, or they can go there to uh, sign up to volunteer. Um, as well, if people are you know interested in sending a check. We are still receiving mail, and so our, our uh, mailing address is 58 Medford Street mm -hmm. uh, in Arlington, 02474. So that's really kind of the best ways. And then please keep us on your radar. So as things lighten up, you know we are hoping to again go back to community food donations. Uh, we've had good success in the past with neighborhood donations where we actually have now uh, a kit in a sense where you can start a um, neighborhood uh, donation drive for us and we kind of have specific items we like different months and so kind of have targeted asked requests. Um, a lot of that's on our Facebook page so you can look up Arlington Eats uh, on our Facebook page. Uh, so those are the kind of the ways to keep you know um, everybody stay safe right now. I think that's the thing I want to tell everybody. And then yeah. when it is time, like we will definitely continue to need your support because again, it's, there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of the economic future of our um, country. And so we think that unemployment is going to stay high for a long time. So we're going to see a lot of people and we're going to have increased needs in our, all of our programs. Yeah, it seem, certainly seems very patently obvious to, 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 to most of us, I would think that, you know, public health, the health crisis itself, first thing to deal with, the economic ramifications of this are something we are all going to be living with, and some much more than others. Let us, let us always remember, you know, uh, folks like myself ensconced in my, you know, my room in my house here getting to talk to you and being interested and supportive of all these things and the work that you do. Nonetheless, that's not the same as the day, as the, the life that, every, you know, tons exactly. of people are waking up to every day. So we do need to stay mindful of that and the fact that that's likely to get only more challenging rather than less as the months go by, even once we feel better about our, our collective health. Um, I wanted to just to invite you as a last thing to, you already mentioned um, staying safe and that that's the most important thing, but to share anything else with our audience that you would like that we haven't been able to cover uh, so far or you either haven't covered so far or uh, any more resources you think of or anything you would like to say just to wrap up. Yeah, um, yeah, I've said this multiple times, but again, Arlington Eats is a community organization. Like we, um, we have our roots in the community here and uh, we have plans to stay in the community for many, many years. You know, unfortunately, hunger is going to be something that we're going to have to deal with uh, for a long time. We'd love to have a hunger-free um, Arlington. Right. Uh, but at this Put moment, it's not going to happen. Right out of business. Wouldn't you love that? I would love that. I would be go, I'd go garden. <laughs> and I would do other things. <laughs> um, so, you know, we're in this together. I think that's the thing I, I keep reminding myself is that we're all in this together as a community, collectively as neighbors, again, serving neighbors, that we're here for each other. Um, and that, you know, if it's a situation where someone needs food for the first time, don't feel ashamed to ask for it. Um, again, how many of us are one paycheck away from, or a medical crisis away from being food insecure? I would say a lot of us are like that. Um, so please reach out if you do need help. Um, and you know, if you are able-bodied and want to work, help, we definitely will, will take your help. Thank you. Great, great message. Great work you're doing. Great conversation here. We really appreciate it. Um, I have been speaking to Andy Doan, who is uh, the executive director of Arlington Eats, one of the, our treasure organizations uh, here in town, relying a lot on volunteer energy, as so many of us do, um, and as we like to highlight here on Million Dollar Gift. 
Andy, once more, thanks very much for the work you and Arlington Eats are doing. Keep it up, stay strong, and we will talk to you on the other side, we hope. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. I'm James Milan. This is Million Dollar Gift. We'll see you later. Mm -hmm.